Okay, you ready, AP? Ready when you are. Let's lay this baby down. Lofty, you on the guitar, mate? You right, Sco? Yep, standing by. Bertie, you on the bass? Yep, ready to go. All right, here we go then. One, two, three, four. Just two good old boys. Two good old boys. Never meeting no harm. Be sorry, never saw the hand, no hair since the day they was born. Straighten the curves. Straighten the curves. Flatten the heels. The coffee might get them, but the Lord never will. For casting away. Mojo Radio Show. If you are regular, take a seat. We'll be pulling out shortly. If you are new, welcome. Thanks for downloading our little show. Just to bring you up to speed, what is the Mojo Radio Show all about? We just find interesting people from any walk of life who have their mojo working in or out of work. We grab their tips, their tools, the stuff they're doing really well, and then we share it to hopefully help you and or your friends, people you know who are going through a hard time, get their mojo working. Uh, to start us off, let's say hello to our driver of the big red bus we call the Mojo Radio Show, Chief Engineer Robbo. Uh, big day yesterday for you, fella. Oh, yeah. Another one. Another one down. Big birthday day. How many day. down? How many down? No, <laughs> How I, many I, behind I, you I'm now? not ashamed. 49. 49 down. 49 down, 50 to go. <laughs> so you've got 12 months to think about what you're going to do for the big 5 Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, and a couple of days to contemplate my first footy game as a 49-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just tuning in, we are going to kick ass. Supreme, the Mojo Radio Show. Now, when I say to you we are talking Taoism, uh, contrary to what Robbo thought is we're not going to Wall Street. <laughs> we're going to Taoism, which is a philosophical tradition of Chinese origin. Now, we haven't done anything in this area ever in our five seasons on the show. Now, Tao is... It's the way. It's what the Chinese called the way. It emphasizes living in harmony. And Justin Ehrlich is a life and health coach that specializes in Taoism. What I like about this guy is he helps people cultivate their physical, emotional, and spiritual lives. He's a longtime practitioner of classical Chinese medicine and a student of Taoism. But at the same time, he blends it with real life, real world examples and his experience in medicine. And it's all about, it's all about sort of biohacking. Now, biohacking is a fairly new practice. And if you would describe what biohacking is, it's about looking at everything we do in our life. How can we change it to enhance the performance or our productivity? It's basically ways to function better. <laughs> What Justin talks about is that Taoism, the guys from original Chinese medicine, they were the original guys who invented biohacking. So what he does, he brings these two things together. I I reckon this whole thing is kind of cool. And when I read about Justin's work, I wrote to him and said, I'd like to ask you a few questions and dig into it. Would you be willing to come on to the Mojo Radio Show? He said, yep, for show. And we have him on the line. So Justin, welcome to the Mojo Radio Show, mate. Thank you so much. I'm really, uh, really happy to be here. So let's just kick it off with when people ask you, 
what you do, how do you like to reply? You know, it, it honestly kind of depends on who is asking me and the, and the situation. But my, my general answer is usually to tell people I'm a, a life and health coach um, that draws upon Chinese medicine and Taoism to try and help people work through really tough struggles. Excellent. Well, that means we've made the right phone call, Robbo. We've got the right guy on the phone. We have made the right phone call. It's interesting, though, talking when we, when we do these interviews, how many of our guests say it depends on who's asking? So now, so now when I'm in a bar and, you know, there's a good-looking bird down the end of the bar and she says, what do you do? I tell her I'm a brain surgeon. Uh, <laughs> situationally appropriate answer, That's right? right, exactly. And I'm you learning. are hoping, and you're hoping she's wearing her beer goggles, aren't you? <laughs> Definitely. Well, she's got to be wearing her beer goggles to be talking to me in the first place, right? <laughs> a portly, a portly brain surgeon. Uh, anyway, look, let's get back to the guest. Um, what I'm interested in, Justin, is right, right out of the get go, you, a stepping stone for you into Eastern philosophy was the martial arts. That's right. What was the attraction, mate? Why Why did you go down that route? You know, it's, it's kind of hard to know. I mean, I can certainly say I watched a lot of the, the classic Shaw Brother movies as a kid and the Karate Kid and the Bruce Lee movies and all those sorts of things. And there was an attraction to the way that they moved and the, the things that they could do. Um, and... I was, you know, fortunate enough to have an opportunity to get to train. And as soon as I did it, there was just this deep resonance. I just, I I really loved it. And uh, it kind of became the center of everything I was doing. I'm interested in this whole philosophy of Taoism and Chinese medicine, but I'm wondering where does, where's the intersection for Eastern and Western medical philosophy today? It's a, it's a moving target. And so you will see Eastern philosophy or Eastern medicine concepts, sort of big picture ideas, showing up more and more at the cutting edge of Western medicine. So the people that are doing the most cutting edge research in Western medicine, many of the discoveries they make are principles that have been written about in, in Eastern medicine and in, in Chinese medicine for millennia. Um, and they're just finding ways to prove some of these things in different um, facets of health, different areas of health. Um, but you still have conventional medicine that, that you know, the average practitioner may not be that well educated about what what is acupuncture? What is Chinese medicine, or or those sorts of things? So it's a it's a mixed bag. It's funny though, isn't it? Because if you go right back to Hippocrates, or as we know him here in the Mojo Radio Show, Hippocrates, um, if you go right back and he said, "Let food be thy medicine," mm-hmm. and then you listen to guys like Ryan Holiday who are writing about the Stoics and Tim Ferriss, who is publishing versions of the great Stoics in audio books and in printed blogs to take us back to Stoicism. Isn't it interesting that you find that the comment you made was that Western medicine is looking at some of the great Eastern philosophies that date back centuries. Is it now that we're looking for data to back these things up? Like these guys knew, (laughs) actually knew what was right and had the right philosophies but we didn't believe them? I think so. I mean, Western Western thinking took a turn from sort of systems-based thinking into individual item-based thinking, where it was like, this drug does this one thing. This tool does this one thing. And the parts got separated from the system as a whole, where Chinese medicine and, and Ayurvedic medicine um, – any of the sort of ancient systems, even ancient Greek medicine and and Persian medicine, were really much more about the integration of the system as a whole, the person in relationship to the society, to the disease, to the medicine. It was always a, a relational process rather than just take this drug and it will do this in every single person that ever takes it. Um, which we're finding out, of course, to be really just not true. There's a lot of responsibility 
has to fall back to the patient, doesn't it? Because we've allowed ourselves, and I've seen this, you go in to visit a medical professional and they had their designated 13 minutes. And before you even sort of outlined you, what you're about, your background, how this might have come about, they've written a script, it's in your hand and you're paying in reception. It, it really seems to have gone down this rabbit hole. We've let ourselves accept the fact that we will be prescribed something and we walk out and we trust that person, that prescription is right. So is the, is the responsibility, do you think, now falling back onto the patient themselves and in doing so, are you finding a trend where we are taking more responsibility? Yes. Um, I think the way that, that the system has evolved um, and where it is currently really, the, it goes back to almost like the idea of, you know, buyer beware, caveat emptor, where we really have to think for ourselves about does this make sense? Does this resonate with me? Do I need to do some research and figure out is this a stopgap solution or is this a empowering solution where I'm actually going to end up healthier if I follow this route or will it just lead to me needing another pill and then another pill and then another pill. Um, And part of that is I think a, at least in, in the States, it's a reflection of partly the educational system for conventional medicine and, and partly really the result of the insurance companies that created the system that doesn't allow for sort of deeper interaction with the patient to really try and solve a problem. Um, it's very complicated, the, the medical system, in terms of how to, to really train doctors well, put them through a very demanding educational system, come out without being horribly in debt, and expect them to work in a way where they're getting paid a minimal amount by an insurance company. So they have to see a large volume of patients to pay their bills because they've invested 10, 12, 15 years of their lives in a lot of money. They have to work to pay their bills, um, but they don't have the time because the insurance companies pay very little, so they have to see a lot of patients. It's really a very challenging situation. That's an interesting system, isn't it? Imagine an insurance company that we we actually paid money to that insured you on being healthy. <laughs> right? Now you're asking too much. Concept. Come on. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, you think about what Justin just said, and Chris Rock, the well-known worldwide comedian, said insurance should be called in case shit happens mm-hmm. because that's the only time you need it is when it hits the fan. But imagine a company, and it's almost like a negative preempt to say you're going to get sick so we're going to insure you when you do get sick but imagine some i mean someone's going to do it where they spin it around saying the healthier you are well that's the the more insurance or the less insurance you know what i mean surely it's in their best interest to do it it really is a conundrum because Mm. you know an, an insurance company has an obligation to turn a profit because it's just a business and the only way that they can turn a profit, if you will, is if they charge us, the patient, more and they pay the doctor less. And none of that really leads to our care, which is what they were funding, is the service they're supposed to be providing. So it's really like there's a, a, a flaw in the approach of that business model that just doesn't work out well for us or really for the doctors either. There's a wonderful question that I heard you mention and she said, what we need to consider is what is this disease hiding? And I -hmm. guess that comes back to that part of taking responsibility where there is no question that there are occasions where a disease is getting the best of us and we need to take immediate action. So I absolutely concur with all that. And then the other side of it is that what is this disease hiding? Like, why did this happen? That's such a profound question, Justin. It, it truly is. It's a, it's a wonderful way to, to sort of guide us gently back towards taking personal responsibility. It doesn't eliminate the need for external support, right? You go see your doctor, you go see your acupuncturist, you go see your surgeon, you go 
see your car mechanic, but you still, we want to pause of like, why is this happening in my life? What is it that I'm reacting to? Um, and how can I control it so that I can ultimately transform this obstacle into a step towards empowerment to be a better version of myself because I now understand myself better. I understand my lifestyle better. I understand my emotional self better. Any of those, those factors. Um, you know, the, the Taoist approach their their sort of ideal is that we go with the flow, right? You're supposed to be able to adapt and just sort of be spontaneous. The, the classic saying in Taoism is that the way of the Tao is spontaneity. And it doesn't mean that we just accept everything, um, but it means we have the capacity to understand and adapt in the moment. And that requires really being present in sort of this constant learning of like, oh, when I touch fire, it burns me. Once I learn the lesson, I most likely won't repeat it. And and so many of the struggles in our lives are often that. It's just this unraveling process of learning about ourselves so that we can adapt and hopefully have less bumps in the road. You talk about the Taoist way as being the integration of the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual side of our lives. Yeah. That, that makes perfect sense. Many people would say, yeah, but I'm doing that. Like I, I do all those things. What's the tell, as they would say in poker, what's the tell that someone doesn't have it going on and all is not well? I mean, just like disease, there can be um, a thousand different variations of how that can show up. And and if we're all really honest with ourselves, myself um, completely included, I'm not doing it, right? Like we're all a work in progress. <laughs> so um, I think once we think that we actually have our our shit together, if you will, <laughs> like we're 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 misleading ourselves. Um, and the Taoist perspective is really how those three facets of our lives are really interrelated. And you can use your physical to help process emotional, or you can use your emotional to help process physical, or you can use really use them interchangeably as ways to cultivate our lives. But, and, and we all do engage with all three of them on some level, but I think there is a fundamental difference between consciously doing so, taking time to pay attention to each facet of our life versus just going through the flow and yeah, when my emotional stuff comes up, I deal with it. And when my physical stuff comes up, I deal with it. But there's not a, a conscious awareness of what I'm doing when there's not a problem. Can I pick one of these areas just because we, it's, it's nice to sort of get a framework for it because in, philosophically I think we're all on the same page. Then I'd like to say, well, how do I demonstrate that? You talk about, let's take the spiritual side. You say listening to our inner voice. H- how do I get in touch with it? What's the inner voice, the inner dialogue? How do I know what is the tell that may, all may not be well? Well, it's the, from the Dallas perspective is, is really kind of where I can – can speak from. Um, there is this idea that we are an embodied spirit. So we have a physical being and we have a, a spiritual side to ourselves. We are a body, a soul inside of a body or a body inside of a soul, because really we see the soul as much bigger than the body. Um, but there is a truth in our heart that contains a certain message that is unique to each of us. And the Taoists would call that a curriculum, a certain life path, a certain life story that is the truth to our life experience and what sort of motivates us in our life, what becomes our drive, the things that really deeply nourish our heart to give us a sense of like all is right in the world when I'm doing these things, as well as the things that are our deepest triggers, the things that, you know, Traffic may be a huge trigger for me and you might not care less about it. And there might be some reason that you react to one thing that I don't react to. And those are the the things that make us unique. And so the touching in with our spirit becomes this process of how do we begin to 
understand who we are. And we look at ourselves physically and we look at ourselves emotionally. And as we are looking at those facets of how we manifest in this sort of human dimension, our emotional relationships and our physical health, there's an inner voice that comes through that tells us how we feel about those things. And that process of sort of sitting and being present with what I like to use the term of um, inner honesty or inner vulnerability is where we start to get in touch with that, that spiritual side of ourselves. Um, there's a lot in the world about external vulnerability. I share with you what, what I'm struggling with, what, what things that I'm, I'm sort of confronting in my life. But really, it was in the, the Taoist paradigm, it would be the inner vulnerability, that capacity to be truly honest with ourselves that is the gateway to understanding our spirit. Do we, do we find ourselves busying ourselves? Do we find distraction, excuses? Do we find that as a way to not create that silence, Justin, to have a true discussion with that inner honest voice? It just seems that today we confuse activity with accomplishment and I'm keeping busy, I'm hustling, I'm getting things done. But quite often that's a distraction to taking the time to really sit in silence. And, and is that kind of how you get people to journal? Like I'm just trying to put a thread together yeah. as how I might go about doing this is yeah. sitting in silence and potentially journaling. Is that what you do? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we certainly live in a time where distraction is um, very easy. And we also live in a time where we're not really taught to slow down and be present. Um, we don't really understand the value of it. And I think that is, is shifting as you see more of a, a rise in people practicing meditation, mindfulness, yogic practices, those sorts of things. Um, and mind mapping, journaling are all gateways into doing that, but so is also just um, honest conversation either with ourselves, taking some time to write down the things that are our triggers or the things that are um, motivating factors. They're a gateway into really starting to see ourselves. Um, one of the things that I like to do with uh, my patients, so with a new patient, um, before I see them, if I have them write a life history, um, breaking down their life in five-year segments from birth to whatever age they are when they're coming to see me, and to make note of all the big physical, emotional, or spiritual events that have occurred in their life during those, that time period. And it's very useful for me to work with the person because I'm able to get an overview of their life. But it's also sort of the first step for getting them to sort of stop, take a pause, and look back at their life and sort of start to see some of the patterns that are show, showing up. Um, I find that to be a very good starting point to sort of get some context around the content of our lives. That's gold. That was gold, bro. Cha-ching. It's, uh, <laughs> that's good. No, that's, that, that's actually very, a really good process. That's gold. Very helpful for me so I can help people better. But every patient I have that has done it is sort of like, yeah, you can end up being a little shocked at what you see. <laughs> <laughs> Start to connect the dots. We're hearing you, brother. Um, so let's put the indicator on and let's do a bit of Taoist philosophy and spontaneously take this off ramp. What does mm-hmm. a Taoist life coach do? And more importantly, I guess, why is a Taoist life coach different to the myriad of life coaches we see on, on the interwebs and or on the street? What's the difference? Taoism at its core is a microcosm, macrocosm system of looking at the world. So what's occurring in nature is occurring in us. And it helps us sort of connect bigger concepts or threads that run in our life. And within that, there is this sort of core principle of you have to, you, you do not have the luxury to not 
integrate your physical, emotional, and spiritual experiences. The benefit is that you get to integrate them, which makes dealing with any of it easier. If you don't have to come at it from only one side, the struggle is that it requires a certain amount of honesty of really looking at all facets of our lives. You can't ignore anything. Um, and that's what makes my the, my approach in terms of working with people makes it different than a typical coach, I would say, that might work with your emotional experience, that might work with your physical health, that might work with your spiritual health. It's sort of how do we integrate those three things? Um, one of the, the tools that I'm quite fond of from within the, the Dallas practices, um, which starts to cross over into the realm of biohacking, is that, you know, biohacking, which is, of course, quite popular these days, is all about getting more for your, more out of each experience that you do. How do you optimize the process? Um, and the Taoists were really the original biohackers, um, or the, you know, the original yogis were the original biohackers who were looking to use breathing techniques, exercising techniques, dietary techniques, um, the Taoists, of course, were very famous for all of their external alchemy of using herbal medicine and minerals and those sorts of things for the sole purpose of simulating an awakening within us. And so it's you're using medicine to stimulate an awakening so you no longer need to use the medicine, which really goes against the sort of modern Western medical model. It's like, here, take your diabetes drug so that you can not have to take your diabetes drug. That's not how the model works currently. Um, and the Taoist approach is really like, do this meditation, take this tea, do this exercise, eat this food, so that you can figure out why you got in the position that you were, so you are, can then get yourself out of that position. The Taoist biohacker was into microdosing. How does that work? And give me an example of how a Taoist might microdose in their day. The idea would be instead of taking, obviously I use mostly Chinese herbal medicine. So um, in my practice, so there's certain herbs that have impact in the body in very specific ways. And at a certain dosage, the impact of that medicine is very physical. You use it to treat a hematoma, a broken bone, um, an infection in your lungs. You're using it really for the physical antibiotic or circulatory supporting benefits of that, that medicinal. But as you begin to microdose, what you start to see with herbal medicine is it has a much bigger impact on the psyche of the person rather than the physicality of the person. And so the way that I will use herbs is um, both for myself um, as well as with my clients is drink this tea, take these herbs, and then do your meditation, do your journaling, see what you can provoke out of the closet, see what you can discover about yourself. So you, you use the medicine in conjunction with your own work. And it's a way to, to hack it, to, to optimize it, to make it more efficient. Um, but you're never really dependent on it. It's just a, a crutch that we draw upon to help us become more awake about ourselves, whatever struggle we're having. Um, and it's, it's really not meant to be something you take like you would a vitamin or something like that, just so that you can have more energy during the day. It's really meant to make your, your practice of, of awakening self more efficient. So do you have a selection of a dozen teas, Justin, that sit and you work your way through them on any given day or week? Because I know you've talked about shaga mushrooms or reishi mushrooms or um, mm -hmm. lotus, is it lotus root? Uh, you've you've yeah, mentioned – yeah. So, how does that work? What's what's your what's the brew? <laughs> what's the brew regularity? Well, how do you use them? There are sort of there are three main products I use. Um, one, which is a tea that's designed to sort of help open Pandora's box, 
And this would be a, a key that I would use with a, a client or myself and say, I know there's something off. I just can't quite place my finger on what it is. But I know there's something there, something under the surface that's hidden. And I want it to come out. I want to be able to understand it. Um, the other is when we, we know what's wrong and we just can't seem to, to break free of that cycle of repetition. So I'm, I'm caught in the cycle of judgment or of relationship patterns or of lifestyle choices or whatever Thank it is. You so I catch myself being triggered by the same things over and over again. Um, and then another layer would be when things are going well and I just want to keep myself well. I want to stay in that sort of positive, productive state. And then with, with clients, I'm always trying to customize things based around that person's unique block because the, the hallmark of, of Chinese medicine is that you treat the person, not the disease. So you might be dealing with some grief and Rubbo might be dealing with some grief and I might be dealing with some grief. But how we process that will be different between the three of us. And so we don't want to just give you herbal tea for grief. We want to give you herbal tea for you. Um, and so it's always, it works better when we can customize it to the, the person. Um, and then I'm also usually doing research on sort of historical or ancient formulas and trying to make them at home and testing them on myself as, as well. It's sort of like the nerd in me, the mad scientist in me, who's, who's just curious about what the ancients did. Um, and so far, I haven't given myself heavy metal poisoning or killed, it, killed myself, <laughs> so all is going well. <laughs> that uh, Let's run through, are they a combo of roots and or mushrooms or adaptogens in mm-hmm. your tea? So tell me, T1, opening Pandora's box, T2, breaking free of judgment is, say, a rut or routine. Number three is it's going yeah. good, but I want to stay good. Give me the recipe for each of those teas. What what would I be putting in my tea? Well, the, they would be Chinese herbs, so you, you may not be familiar with the names of them, but um, the Pandora's box formula is a mixture of um, – uh, a root called cypress root, xiangfu is the uh, the Chinese herb. Um, Shangzhi, which is a gardenia flower, and shichangpu, which is the root of the acorus plant. And it's a, a classic combination, um, in part, that's designed to open up the chest to allow the heart to sort of manifest itself. It's used uh, classically for things that are deeply held inside, but can't get out to the surface. Um, the, uh, a chorus root that's in there is not, uh, a psychedelic, um, but it does have the, the capacity to slightly alter our perception. So it allows us to sort of see things in a new way. Um, the, formula that's designed for when things have come out of the box that we are entangled with um, is a, a modification of a classical formula called the three spirits or the three roots. And it's Dan Shen, which is a, a red salvia root, uh, Xuan Shen, which is scrofularia root, and uh, Ku Shen, which is Sephora root. And it's actually one of my preferred formulas. It's really quite a beautiful concept that's contained within the formula. And that is that for us to disentangle ourselves from a recurrent struggle, we sort of have a few steps that we have to do if we really want to succeed at it. And that is that we have to slow down the story. We have to take away some of the charge, whatever our reaction is when it's happening, it's intense. We need to like, the Chinese medicine term is we need to clear some heat. We just need to like turn down the volume a little bit. And then once we've done that, and there's a little bit of space there, we need to be able to go inward to sit with ourselves, to be present with ourselves. And we need to start to sort of soften up to our reactivity that's going on and just sort of learn to be with it. And then once we've completed those two parts, we can begin the process of disentangling from 
what is really us and what is really them or what is really the external factor and what is the internal factor. Um, and that formula represents this sort of beautiful concept of how we, we begin the process of disentangling from something. Um, I've used it for, for years personally, as well as with my clients. And it's really quite a, a remarkable, remarkable formula written by somebody far smarter than myself. Um, Hundreds, and oh, hundreds you. of years ago. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what occurs to me, Justin, is that when you were studying this, not only did you have to study the herbs themselves, but it sounds like you had to study the Chinese language just to get your mouth around them. Yes. Yeah. And the, the names often contain concepts. And so studying Chinese, like I'm not a, I'm not a scholar of Chinese language, um, but the concepts that are contained within the names of a an herb often contain lessons. And so it's really worthwhile to study the Chinese name compared to knowing that it's called salvia root or a chorus root or something like that. That doesn't really mean anything, the Latin name, or at least not always. Sometimes the Latin names have meanings as well, but um, the Chinese names almost always imply a story with the name. And so it's worthwhile looking at it in that way. There's a couple of things with this, Justin, that I'm going to ask you about. Number one is, can we get from you a list of what you just talked about? Because absolutely, as you yeah. were downloading that for us, uh, I was having difficulty writing it, <laughs> um, spelling it. <laughs> It both, let alone pronouncing it, all I could think about was Mr. Wang from <laughs> Ocean's Eleven. Um, the other part is where do I get it? Do I have it? Is there, a, is there a dealer that lives in the back blocks of San Diego? You call and go, hey, Carlos, I need to mushroom, mate. <laughs> When's the shipment arrive? How, how do I get it? Well, I mean, Chinese, one, yes, absolutely. I'll send you a... Uh, I'll email you some, some write-ups on those products so you have that. Um, no problem at all. And, you know, Chinese herbal medicine is a, a pretty well-regulated medical practice here in the States, and I believe it's, you know, it's fairly well-regulated in Australia as well. Um, and you would have to go to a, an herbalist. Um, I have a line of, of products that I'm launching that, that contain, that are these teas, which I'm happy to ship to anyone. Um, but, Normally, you would just go to a Chinese pharmacist to buy the, the tea. There aren't, there isn't anybody out there making these products in this yeah. form. Yeah. Uh, so, what are you do, what are you doing in an unlicensed car in a trench coat, a jacket, yeah. <laughs> in the back blocks of dark? Exactly. Mate, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a Chinese herb distributor. It's That's cool, right. dude. What do you need? I'm sure there are um, acupuncturists there locally that that could carry these herbs. I was just going to say, I use a, a, an acupuncturist for my Crohn's disease, who, uh, just around, just lo who lives mm -hmm. locally to me. And, um, and when he, when, yeah. it, when it flares up, he gives me a tea and I don't know what's in it. And I certainly, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I certainly wouldn't sit down and drink it if I had a choice. Uh, but it, but it works. Yes. It, it definitely works in conjunction yeah. with, with everything else. So, um, so I yeah. think that's you know, one of the nice with things this. with, uh, with using herbs in microdoses, the flavor is much less intense. I think for the listener, this is something that's really worth investigating because as you're rattling them off, I could imagine some people going, this is all gobbledygook. But when you think about Taoist biohacking versus traditional today's biohackers, there's a lot of talk about nootropics, Siltep, Alpha Brain, mm -hmm. Ashwagandha, you hear a lot of guys mm -hmm. at the front end and guys who really do a lot of research and data and experimentation like yourself. There's something in this. I think it's just a matter of choosing which flow you take to experiment with because some are, uh, let's just say, on the fringe, uh -huh. um, but some are more traditional like this, aren't they? Yeah. And when you look at Western medicine and sort of the cutting edge of research, um, one of the more interesting areas would be the integration of what they call psychoneuroimmunology, which is the integration of the immune system, the psych psychological system, and the neurological system. 
that there is this direct correlation to how those three systems interact with each other and affect each other. Um, and you can take something, you know, on a very simple level and look at something like uh, the Wim Hof method with the breath work. You know, here you have this guy who, who summited Mount Everest in shorts. It's <laughs> quite a remarkable yogic feat. And, you know, his basic principle is via breath work. Whether we've done double blind placebo controlled studies to be able to clearly delineate how something is working in the body to cause a repeatable um, benefit may not have been done. But certainly there are plenty of people that have studied his method that go off and submerge themselves in icy water and do perfectly fine with it. Um, and the Taoists were really, in a sense, they were just very good at slowing down, listening and thinking. And so when I describe like the, the three cent tea of the, there's one herb that helps us to slow down our reactivity. There's one herb that helps bring us inward into ourselves. And there's one that helps us disentangle ourselves from the struggle. And that concept of whenever we're caught up in something, the fact that we need to slow down the fact that we need to center ourselves and go inward to really sort out who we are as the first two steps before we can try to disentangle ourselves from something, that concept should be fairly universal. Whether we use Chinese herbs or we use essential oils or we use a pharmaceutical or a nutraceutical or a breathing technique, that part really shouldn't matter. Um, and I think for me, when I look at products, that's always what I'm looking at. It's like, what what principle did this person get? Do they understand the system that they're using? Is there a, a methodology that, it, that really just makes sense? And I like hearing you talk about this, Justin. I like your approach to it and the calm, thoughtful nature you bring to it. And one of the things I heard you talk about, which I thought – Anyone could do today, regardless whether in San Diego, whether in Sydney or they're in Johannesburg. You said the Eastern philosophy is to integrate with nature and match the rhythm of nature. And anyone listening at any time of the day, anywhere, could do that right now, whether it be spring, summer, whatever it may be. But I don't know, it just seems that we get so caught up with the doing part, we forget about the power of nature and seasonality. But that is a core philosophy in the Eastern approach, isn't it? And we really look at it in the, the seasons of our life as well. So it's not just, you know, spring for a, a four-year-old and spring for an 18-year-old and spring for a 60-year-old. They're all going to be very different in how we experience it because we're also in different phases of our life. Um, and we want to be able to sort of pause and and look at like, well, what is motivating me to work that extra hour or get up that a little bit earlier or, you know, do whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and how does that relate to being like, just honest with ourselves about what's natural for the day, for the weather, for my life. Um, we can all, we can all sort of resonate that in winter, we tend to be a little more quiet and inward we stay inside because it's generally colder and more wet. And in summer, we tend to go out more. And that's just one example of, of flowing with nature. What's transmission in Chinese medicine? On a disease level, transmission represents how disease progresses. So um, I don't exercise, I don't eat particularly well, and there's a downstream cascade that occurs um, as the disease progresses. It's also how the body responds to disease. So if I get an infection, my body creates a fever. That's also the body responding to the external environment, which is healthy. Even though it may not be pleasant, it's not pathological. Um, and then transmission is also how you connect into things, how you receive lessons, how you have a resonance with something. Somebody says something and it, it awakens something in you and you can't really quite describe why that is. 
but you, you hear somebody say something, you read something and there's just this deep resonance within you of like, that's my truth. I get that. That makes sense to me. And it sort of, it creates a shift within you. Um, three different ways that, that transmission can show up. With disease, we're always looking to figure out where did the disease start and how did it get to where it's at? Because by the time you see most people, the, the symptoms have been there for a long time, but the disease began a year ago, five years ago, a couple decades ago, and you're trying to, to backtrack. You're trying to do your detective work to figure out how did it originate so you can hopefully get it to go away. I could spend hours talking to you about this stuff. There is just so much that I am fascinated by and would love to dig into, but I'm respectful of your time today, Justin. We started the show talking about your journey into martial arts and there's a Bruce Lee quote that we quite often talk about and it's, it's not the daily addition but the subtraction hack away at the unessentials. And Bruce Lee was talking about the fact that it's not just putting more and more and more stuff in, which is our show is not about always putting more stuff into your day, but quite often it's actually what you take out that has the most profound effect. What's something that you personally have hacked away at in the last 100, 200 days that's had a profound impact? Like what have you taken out that's had a profound impact upon you as a Taoist, as a man, as a family man, as a partner? You know, uh, subtraction is really the process of refining the the impure in our lives, the things that don't serve us. And, and I'm constantly trying to find ways that I can show up better. And that can be something as simple as cutting off hours of work. Um, for me, being self-employed and having my own business, I'm in a, like a constant struggle to manage my time. It's one of my bigger sticking points. And so I'm constantly trying to find ways to cut things out or set limits on myself. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing that I do all the time is just trying to like set a limit. I'm going to do this work till this time. And I'm not going to let anything take me away from whatever I'm going to do after that. Um, and I'm just constantly confronting that that balance um, by far the, the biggest struggle I face on a day-to-day basis. We will get those teas from you, which I think is awesome. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Mr. Wang has in mind for us. Um, and um, <laughs> also, I know you work with people all over the world. So even though you have a practice, Today's technology allows you to work with anybody, anywhere. Where would people check you out, mate? Where do you send people to get details on you and your work? Just come to my website, which is uh, my name. It's Justin, J-U-S-T-I-N, Ehrlich, E-H-R-L-I-C-H, which will, I'm sure will be up on your, your podcast. Um, and book a call. I'm glad to chat with anyone. Um, there's a good download about understanding your life path and sort of reflecting on the the data points to kind of get people started to think, starting to think about what's been going on in their lives. Um, and yeah, I mean, most of the work I do is actually not here in San Diego at this point. Um, I work with really a lot of people all over because, you know, it's, it's a process of empowerment rather than something where people come to me passively to get stuck with a needle. Um, that's uh, not the part that, that interests me so much, even though I do love acupuncture. I think it's fabulous, but uh, I'd rather tell somebody go practice this for a month and then come back. I'd like to uh, chat with you again, perhaps later in the year, Justin, only because I think sometimes it's nice to hear somebody with a different perspective who's calming, thoughtful, provocative on an emotional level, spiritual level, wellness, health, physical level. I think it's a really good, Check in for people, and I like the idea of where the Taoists can meet today's conventional medicine. So, if we can impose upon you, might be we, we'll get in contact with you later in the year because I've got a lot more I'd like to run through in terms of the Taoist, how it looks, adaptogens, how it's affecting our DNA yeah. and our genetics. So, can we get you back on sometime later in the year? 
I would love to do that. It would be fabulous. The Mojo Radio Show. As I said during that interview, I actually take a few Chinese herbs every now and then as prescribed by my acupuncturist for my Crohn's disease. Um, whilst I highly recommend the efficiency of them and the efficacy of them, I can't really testify to the taste of them because it's not something that's particularly pleasant. Oh, yeah, they're not they are not nice to eat and they stink when they're making them. Yes. <laughs> However, as my little girl quite often says to me is, how can you eat that? How do you drink that? And I go, well, I don't really care what it tastes like, what it smells like, what it looks like. As long as it's good for me, I'm into it. So <laughs> you do have to, put, you have to put aside your senses yep. when you're going down this track. But I've had a long history back in the, back in the day with uh, Chinese herbalists and medicines and and um, he got me through some hard, hard health times. So I'm a great believer as well, mate. Hold your nose. That's the big one. That's the big tip. Hold your nose and swallow. <laughs> Have you checked your email this morning, Mulder? No, why? Because I received something unsettling and I wondered if you'd gotten it too. The Mojo Mailbag. All right, quickly before we close this little shindig, a little bit of mail in the bag. Um, and I, I'm going to read this one out because I kind of like this. This came from Nick who wrote to us and said, I just want to let you know I really enjoyed the show and I've been listening since earlier this year when a friend of mine put me on to your podcast. Now, here's the reason I'm reading this out from Nick. Great content. Really enjoyed Marcus Child's interview. As you said, there was loads of gold in that episode. Cheers, in brackets, with a Doseki. Thank you, Nick. So I'll put a link to that show from Marcus Child into the show notes because that was a cracker. Uh, there was, and he's right, Nick's right, there was loads of gold in that. And another note I got, this, and this is a, a beautiful lesson for parents to learn. This came from Matthew who wrote to me through LinkedIn and he said, this was after I'd given a speech and I talked about when kids walk up and go, hey, dad, I'm bored. Rather than fix the problem for them, we should say, good, something is about to happen. So here's what happened. Matthew wrote, a great reminder, Gary, your advice even worked for my five-year-old. When he came to me last weekend with the usual, dad, I'm bored, I tried your approach. James, being bored means you're leaving your head nice and clear, ready for a good idea to pop into it. Off he went, then shortly after, excitedly called me over to show me he discovered a totally new and novel way to assemble his tired old train track. Nice. How good's that? <laughs> Excellent. There you Isn't go. Isn't that just good? Isn't that just a good story? That's the result you want to hear. Just when the media is full of stuff you don't really want to know about, I just think that, that that's the power of podcasts. It's the power of someone who takes an idea and does something with it. So thanks for sharing, Matthew. That's uh, That's a cracker. So- Another guy called Nick wrote to me and said, do you take requests? And I went, well, what do you mean? He said, well, song requests, like a radio station takes requests. And I went, well, we can do whatever we want because it's our show. That's right. It depends what the request is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, I was listening to some of your shows and for whatever reason, the baby animals came to mind. Oh, do you remember nice. the baby animals? Of course. Who could forget Susie DiMarchi? What a great girl she was. Great front lady. And I've got to say, Having you've met the, you've met the, the the band, haven't you? Yeah, a couple of times. Just yep. great people. I remember one afternoon being in the studio. Remember Strawny, Ian Strawn? Yes. Yes. Okay. How could I forget Strawny? <laughs> so it was about three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, and there was no one else in the whole radio station except Strawny, who was on air, and me sitting there keeping him company. And he said, "Oh, GB, can you do me a favour? There's a band coming in. Can you go and just keep them busy? I can't I can't do anything till four o'clock. Just keep them busy. I can't do anything till three thirty. Just." Um, get him a beer or just keep them company. I went, oh, and I used to hate, hate being around the celebrities. Anyway, they were the loveliest love. They were so cool, so relaxed, just real people and just a kick butt rock band. I've got a great song we could play if he wants to hear the baby animals. After that interview, we should really play Painless. Uh, well, we could. Uh, that's an option. Can I give you another option? Sure. <laughs> Go for your life. <laughs> well, no, there was... I've been pondering this for quite a few days since I got this note from Nick with the baby animals and I was thinking of another track and the track I'm thinking about is One Word. Okay. Yeah, good song. Great song. It's a rockier song. It's probably more us. But the other thing that it made me think of, and it's not so much a lesson of rock, but I think it's a lesson in general, is that people hear podcasts, they read books, they read blogs, they go to conferences, go to seminars, and everybody's saying, give me the next idea. And the real question is, well, have you made use of the last one? 
And we keep, we're all hungry for new learnings and we're consuming content, but content only becomes knowledge when you use it, you experiment, you do something with it. And once that knowledge has been used in lots of different applications and trials, only then does it become wisdom. So what I was thinking about is we should play one word because out of every gig we do on this show, let's just hope that people take one word or one concept, one idea, and actually do something with it to turn that content into knowledge. And only by doing so will it then become wisdom. And I don't know, I think it's a rockier song. I think it's more us. Should we finish with a little one word? See, you would think that I like that. Is produced and recorded in the studios of Voodoo Sound. For more tips and tools to get your mojo working, check us out on Facebook at the Mojo Radio Show or online at the Mojo Show.com. For more about Gary, see GaryBurtWhistle.com or to polish your next audio or video production, check out VoodooSound.com.au and for the right voice, RealtimeCasting.com. Andrew Peter speaking. See you next time.